A boater hits the rocks in Marina Del Rey, sending someone overboard. Ooh. Our assignment manager, Mark Liu, is at the desk with video of the rescue. Mark. Yeah, Ruba, it is intense video. It was shot by the rescuers themselves. They responded to a mayday call of a boat crashing against the rocks on the break wall near the marina, and someone went overboard. They had to be pulled out of the water. Let me show you that video. It was posted by the LA County Sheriff's Department on their social media today. You're looking at a 28 foot boat in serious distress as it crashed against the rocks in Marina Del Rey last night. LA Sheriff's deputies, along with LA County lifeguards, responded with multiple boats in order to rescue everyone on board this vessel. At least one person on that boat went overboard. That person was rescued from the water. They're going to be okay. Ultimately, the sheriff's rescue boat named the Tradition was able to get a tow line to that disabled vessel and tow it out of danger. That disabled boat did suffer some damage to its hull, but it was not taking on water, so it's not going to sink. No one on board was injured. It's unclear what the vessel was doing out there near the rocks, but the sheriff's uh, deputy sent a reminder to anyone who is fishing for lobster. They need to pay careful attention to the sea conditions and where their fishing lines are. That is the very latest here from the desk. I'll send it back to you. We all know this legendary song from the Eagles, Hotel California, and now it has become the center of an unusual criminal trial underway right now. It has to do with handwritten pages of lyrics. We're joined now live in studio by Jane Davidson. She's an attorney and adjunct music law professor at USC. Welcome. Thank you so much. This is super in interesting, right? There's like so many theories floating out there about what actually is going down, but it really has to do with uh, the lyrics, handwritten lyrics, pages of them, and uh, the, these defendants who then were trying to sell them. So is this about how these defendants obtained the lyrics or whether they have the right to sell the lyrics? Yeah, so the interesting thing about this case is that there's a separate person who's not even a defendant in the case at all, who was the person who got the lyrics in the first place, allegedly for a biography. And so all three of the defendants are people who then were trying to acquire them from him after the fact. Okay, so so now there's the issue of how the band also tried unsuccessfully to get the lyrics back. That's been brought up in the trial. Why does that matter? So a big issue that's come up, and yesterday Irving Azoff, who was the former manager of the Eagles, testified in the case. Um, they were constantly trying to get it back, and they, Don Henley said that he felt like he was being extorted by mm -hmm. them, which I think is what crossed this over from something that typically would have been more of a civil lawsuit to something that they sought some type of criminal action in. So it's more of an extortion case than a theft case or a copyright case. Yeah, so the charges themselves are theft charges, and there's mm -hmm. also a conspiracy charge, but really um, the issue here that I think is what led Don Henley and his team to go to the Manhattan DA's office was how they felt about how the defendants were trying to get things back. And I was also reading there is an issue of a contract that the defendants say we had a contract about this material we have, or no, I'm sorry, that the band said we had a contract that any material obtained for the biography still belongs to us, but the defendants say they don't even know about a contract. What's going on there? So when these lyrics allegedly were obtained by this third party person who's not a defendant <laughs> in the case, he was writing a biography on the Eagles. And so they sent him all sorts of materials to base the biography on. But typically in that type of situation, if you're writing someone on someone's behalf, they probably want the materials back after they finish whatever project they're working on. Now, I haven't seen the actual contract in this case, but it would be typical to say something like, we will give you all of these, but then you have to return them after the project is done. Unfortunately, this book wasn't a good book, and they ended up not publishing it, and it was a huge fight between the Eagles and this author, um, and that's, I think, what led to this happening. And then it ends up in the hands of these other people, and people are trying to auction off the lyrics, etc. Absolutely. I mean, these things are potentially very valuable. There's been estimates that it's anywhere from $15,000 to a million dollars for purchasing these lyrics. Music memorabilia is very valuable. So this is obviously pretty unusual to be a criminal case uh, involving music, but in your experience uh, as a lawyer and as a music law expert, what do you think happens here? How does this play out? Yeah, so the biggest difference between a civil case, which is what I primarily practice, and a criminal case is the burden of proof involved and also the types of remedies available to the people involved in the case. So on the criminal side, it's actually more difficult to prove because you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, versus in a civil case, you basically have to say, well, it's you know, more likely that they mm -hmm. were correct or not correct. Um, so when we're looking at the criminal case, there's some 
big issues in how they're going to prove that these defendants knowingly, meaning they knew these things were stolen when they tried to acquire this property, versus if you were dealing with a civil case and you know the damages that Don Henley and the Eagle suffered from not having these, it would be a little bit easier to prove that. And it's confusing because they all have different stories. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's and, so many of them. Yeah, and that's part of what the issue with them trying to get it back. And then when the DA's office in Manhattan was investigating this, they kept changing their story as to how this happened. And that's how it got so muddy. Okay, well, thanks for helping clear some of it up for us. Jane, <laughs> we appreciate you coming in today. Thank you so much. Thank you.